Support for this program comes from viewers like you. Thank you. Have a seat and get comfortable because we have an interesting conversation to share with you. This week we go one-on-one -on -one with the wife of a famous Wichita native who is carving her own niche in the city's history. People who know the name Kate Lehrer recognize her as an acclaimed novelist and life partner of former PBS anchorman Jim Lehrer. The two have been married since 1960, meeting in Texas where Jim moved with his family after living his early days in Wichita. But Kate also has a connection to the air capital by way of the sea. She's the official sponsor of the new USS Wichita battleship that was commissioned in January of 2019. Here she is helping to officially launch the ship into active duty. It's a high honor for the city to have another new ship named after it. And it's an honor for us to welcome Kate Lehrer to the program. We'll find out about her mission as sponsor of the USS Wichita, about her career as a literary sensation, and what it's like to be married to the famous Jim Lehrer. We have lots to talk about and only a half hour to do so. So let's get started and go one-on-one -on -one with Kit Lara right now. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Victor Hawkstrom. It's a pleasure to welcome the accomplished and charming Kate Lehrer to the program. Thank Hi, you. Kate. Hi, Kate. How are you, Victor? Good to see you. Good to be it's here. It's my first time meeting you. That's right. Yes. And mind you. Um, you are married to Jim Lehrer, mm -hmm. a famous man. Mm -hmm. um, what does that make you? That makes me a woman married to a famous man. <laughs> <laughs> but with a very, my very own life. Right. Yes. And your life is uh, writing, and we'll get to that in a moment. Yes. But you are from Texas, mm -hmm. uh, born and raised. Yes. And Jim is from Wichita. Yes. So how is that, how has that worked out over, over 58 years? You know, that works just fine because I was born in McKinney, Texas, which is just 30 miles north of Dallas. It's also on the plains. From Wichita to Dallas, you get pretty much plains. So there's not so much difference in there. And it works out fine. But I've also got to tell you, Victor, that after I didn't know him then, but after Wichita, then of course he moved to South Texas. Um, ending up in San Antonio. And when he was not such a young, like mid-career, he came home one week and said, oh, I've just been uh, nominated. I'm going to be the Kansan of the year. And I said, well, that's great, darling, you know, fine. And then he came home the next week and he said, oh, I am going to be the Texan of the year. Oh boy. And I said, you're just a fraud. You've got to choose. You can't be both Texas and Kansas. So. <laughs> but he didn't have to choose, and he did accept both awards. Right. However, Kansas is his great right. heartbeat, yeah. So tell us about your growing up days in Texas. Uh, I loved growing up in Texas. Uh, it, I was in a small town at the time. It's grown much since then, but it was 12,000 people. And I think it was a great place for a young girl to grow up. I felt I could do anything I wanted to. And I was very tall as a child. So I could beat all the boys in football. Mm. I could play, I wasn't that good at baseball, but I could hold my own because I had all these male cousins. Right. and. It was, so there was no sense that I needed to hold myself back and not do the kinds of things the boys did. Plus I was big for my age. 
that helped me feel very strong uh, always. After probably I should have stopped feeling that I was that strong. Also in terms of grades and school, that was just fine too. I mean, no, there was no sense of limits on what I could do and what I'd be capable of. My mother didn't put limits. My father died when I was young at seven. So I just had her and she was a very strong, independent woman herself. I just, it was just great because of this sense of independence that was fostered there. Loved it. Now, Jim told the story when he was on this program mm -hmm. about meeting you in an apartment complex. Yes. The same complex that both of you lived in. Yes. When you first met him, what ran through your mind? Because when he first met you, he saw sparkles. Yes. Well, when I first saw him, I was actually moving in. And he was coming down the steps. He had been there for a couple of months. I was just moving in over Labor Day to teach school. And I saw all I could see, because I had this box of books in my hand, and I saw, all I could see of him at that moment were legs. And he, he's so fair. He's never had a tan after that summer in his life. But that summer he'd gotten a tan, and he'd gotten a tan when he was still in the Marine Corps because he was playing tennis all the time. He was getting ready to go play tennis, and I thought, oh, that's somebody with great legs. <laughs> <laughs> we sort of reversed the order of things. Right, right. And then when I saw his face, I thought, oh, he's cute. Well, he got just, we sort of nodded. He got just past me, and then he turned around and said, can I carry your books? And I said, yes. He carried my books. And then much later, we'll skip a day or two, he was helping me. I didn't have many books because I was in a very, I was sharing a bedroom with another friend. So I was in there and he said, I said, he said, oh, you have Ulysses by James Joyce. And I'd, I said, yes, I do. Which I had read that summer. I was an English lit major and I just graduated and thought, well, I never read this book and I'd better read it right now. I don't know what I thought, why I thought I had to read it right now, but I did that summer. I got a lot of it, but I didn't get everything. And he said, oh yes, he had read Ulysses. And I was really impressed that I had met this very cute guy who was willing to carry my books, help me kind of get things set up and had read Ulysses at this also. So skip ahead 10 years. We've got three ch children, babies, and he finally confesses that he had cliff notes for Ulysses. He had read the book, but he had also read the cliff notes because he just got so much out of it that I hadn't gotten out of it. Now, I was such a purist. I never read a cliff note in my life. I hardly knew what a cliff note was. And I said, you've waited, you've waited 10 years, three children, and now you're gonna tell me about this. So then skip another 15, 20 years. We have a place that we can go for the weekends outside of Washington. And I've been in Texas for the weekend. I come back, he has got, we got a barn. We don't have horses. We don't do anything like that with anything, but he wanted a barn. Sure enough, he'd gone and gotten an old bus, a 46 flexible clipper, if I've got that right, he'll correct me <laughs> at some point. <laughs> so, and, so, and then he says, I've got to show you the bus. I've got, I've got to show you. So we, it's summer, I get in the garage, the flies and mosquitoes are out there. We find, it takes a long time for him to get the bus into rear gear so we can get out of the garage. We get out finally and we get down into a field. We're going to circle the field and the bus stalls and we're just sitting in the old dried grass and flies again and mosquitoes, gnats. And out of my mouth, I can't believe it. I had no idea. I said, 
and to think I married you because you'd read Ulysses. <laughs> it just like was my, oh, what is this? <laughs> So uh, yes. talking about Ulysses, uh, uh -huh. you became a writer. Yes. How did that come about? I had decided I'd become a writer at seven. I, I wrote stories for little children's magazines. And my mother never sent them off, but I didn't know she didn't send them off. Mm -hmm. I'd just write them out in longhand. I like to tell stories. I love to have stories read to me. Then about 12, I read a book that started Encore, Encore, Susanna Gilmore. And I thought, I already knew by 12 that I was a lousy pianist. So I was never going to make it with encores. And I didn't have much of a voice. So I thought, well, what could I do? I thought, no, nope, back to the writing. I can write. And so I was looking for immortality. I think because my father died so young, I was, I was looking for immortality. And... I would get it that way. And at night 17, I revisited this dream. Was it just a dream? I kept revisiting the dream, and all I could ever come up with really was the writing. But I decided I would teach school. Even then, I understood you had to support yourself some other way. So I would teach school to support myself and give back to society because I wasn't sure my books would give back to well, anybody but me, you know. But uh, you went uh, a step further and you produced or wrote a lot of books. I and did, but it took a long time. Yeah, so yeah. What, what inspires you? What, what is the thing that, you know, Jim in, on this program says he came back to Wichita to be inspired in about four of his novels uh, relate to Wichita, things that happen right. here. What inspires you? I think what inspires me are, I will read something else, having nothing to do with anything, and then I will just find a kernel of an idea, mm -hmm. or I'll overhear a conversation, or an interchange, and that will trigger something in me. Do you go anywhere uh, to get that inspiration? I don't really need to that much. Do you lock yourself much. up in the room? What, what just, do you do? I, need, I do need to be quiet. I'm, Jim has the powers of concentration that are beyond me. I mean, if he were here with us and he had some novel going in his head, if the two of us were talking and he was sitting right there, he could be writing his novel, mm -hmm. and then he could join our conversation. I am incapable of that kind of right. concentration. Right. I sometimes have hated him for the fact that he's got it and I don't, but I, it takes me a long time. I take a big wind up to it, right. uh, to writing. And then I had three children pretty young and realized I really thought I could do everything when I was young. I did think I could do everything, and I realized suddenly, as the saying used to go about Gerald Ford, which wasn't true about him at all, but he couldn't walk and chew gum at the <laughs> same time. Well, I couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. Uh, you were also on the radio program, a, a former book NPR panelist for book reviews. Yes, and that was fun. It was, Diane Ream had right. started this, and she would have it once a month, and everybody would read the same book was her book club, and she would have usually three guests, and I would be there to talk about the sort of the literary aspect mm -hmm. of the book. There would be somebody else there talking about um, who understood the subject, whatever the subject was, and somebody else who might bring another viewpoint in. Sometimes there would be two of us who could talk about it in terms of the literature part mm -hmm. and what the book really meant and sort of going to subtext and all that stuff, which an audience is only just so interested in. Right. She knew how to mix it up. It was, it was a great, it was fun. It was just a good so, thing to so do. So you were a form of a broadcaster too. I, I, in my like, own way. It, it runs in the family. <laughs> it runs in the family. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, what are your most famous novels you've written that 
people talk about the most? Um, can, I wrote one called Confessions of a Bigamist, about a woman bigamist. Mm -hmm. That was just fun because it's a woman and I can't tell you how many men told me a woman wouldn't do that. And I said, oh, is that right? <laughs> well, of course, by then I'd done plenty of research. I knew right. full well women did that. Prisons at one point were filled with women who were bigamists because, in this country because it was so easy back in frontier right. times to leave and go somewhere else if you got too tired of it. Now, there's something else that uh, you are becoming very famous for and you are the sponsor of the USS Wichita warship. Yes, I, that just makes me so proud. How did that come about? It, I got a call from the Secretary of the Navy who had been governor in Mississippi when my husband and I both, Jim and I would go to Mississippi to see Eudora Welty a few times. We were really lucky to get to know that woman and the governor loved Eudora Welty and he had a little party for her. We met, we met her and it was just, it was great. So he remembered that and he remembered, she always made sure that he, everybody knew I was a novelist as well as my husband being an anchorman and a novelist. And he called me one day and said, hi, like we had seen each other yesterday, which was not the case. It had mm -hmm. been quite a few years. And he said, would you like to, you know, be the sponsor of this ship? And I said, well, I would love it. I don't know what it means, but I would love it. And of course, Jim, he wasn't a fool, this Navy secretary, Ray Mabus. He knew that Jim had grown up in Wichita. Right. So that made the that connection. That was the connection. Right. Perfect, yes. Right. And so and you, I you loved christened it. the ship. I christened the ship. I hit that bottle of champagne <laughs> against the hull or, or whatever you call it. See, that's how bad I am with my <laughs> ship terms. In the first swing, which was scary. <laughs> I was afraid I'd miss. But it worked. The bottle it worked, broke. It worked. It broke. It broke that so, champagne splashed So what all does over being me. the sponsor mean? It means from now on, doing my best, and I hope all of Wichita will help too, of helping be with the crew, writing notes, looking after in any way that they might find necessary, staying in contact with the commander of the fleet mm -hmm. and with in as many, you know, doing what I can always to try to help the Wichita. Do you plan to take a ride, sail on it? Oh, I would love it. I don't know that they'll offer me that, no. but if they did, I would love to but do that. But you are the sponsor. But I am the sponsor. You'd <laughs> think they'd at least take me around the bay right. or something. Yep, yes. Yep. Yes. But guess what? What's that? Your husband is in the studio. And we will ask him to join us. Let's do it. Yes, let's yes. do it. All right? He'd better just not correct me on anything. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. We have Jim joining us, Jim Lehrer and his darling wife, Kate, the power couple. Do people see you as a power couple? Do they reference you as that? I don't feel that they do, but maybe they have in the past. I don't think we I qualify because no, to, to be a power couple, that means you have to have the power over something other than yourself. <laughs> yes. Influence. And we don't. Yeah, we Influence. don't even have power Will with you? our daughters. I mean, with our family. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the, the the power couple is is uh, when you add up one and one, it should be at least three or four when you add them up. And I think you add up one and one with us, you get get two. You do get two. Yeah. Period. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, the two of you are novelists. Um, how are your writing styles dif different from each other? We, we, you told us you, had, you were on one-on-one, -on -one, Jim, uh, mm -hmm. in two uh, specials, and you told us what in, inspires you, and you come back to Wichita sometimes to be inspired. We heard from Kate. So how, is, how are the writing styles different now? 
I would describe them as the difference between night and day. Yes, that's true. <laughs> we, that right? We're very different in our styles, which has made it possible for us not to be as competitive with one another as we might be. He writes about 10 times faster than I do. Uh, that has been not such a good thing for me, but it's been, a, I think it's probably worked out well that way. We're just very different. And we write about read. different things. And we write completely different we, things. Somebody's uh, painting back to your power couple thing uh, related to this. People have always said, well, are, are you and, you and, uh, ask me, are you and Kate going to write a book together? Or, and then Kate yeah. would ask Kate, or Kate, are you and Jim going to write together? No way. No. Uh, no way. Uh, uh, no. no way. Why, why not? We, we because we love each other too much. Oh. <laughs> yes. And then we might kill each other. <laughs> 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 So what intrigues you when you're writing versus you, Jim, one at a time? You go for escape. Yeah. Well, when I'm writing, I, I get completely caught up in the characters, just completely, and want to make them each one tick. What's driving this character? What's driving that character? I can lose the thread of the plot if I'm not very careful. Jim is big on plot, and he would like it if I were better with plot. So I can talk to him about that, though. Yeah, but that's the, that actually is the difference. Yeah, uh, I get lo I get lost in the plot. I get in the story, and I and I don't go as deep as I should, uh, uh, or as deep as Kate does in, in character. And so it's uh, uh, it, it you're in terms of the question about writing. Uh, her her stuff is so much more deeper than mine and better than mine because of that, because it's no. character-driven rather than story-driven. My novels tend to be story-driven more than character-driven. No, I think you, you do better than I do. That's just really nice, but it's not true. <laughs> yes. No, faster is not always the best thing. Is no. It? no. Yeah. Well, yours is story-driven because of the journalist in you? I think so. I think it's the story that, start, that, turn, that starts me off. Mm -hmm. With Kate, it's more the character, as she said. It's the character that yeah. starts her off. Yeah. And it's where you begin. You know, hopefully, you, get, you start with the story or you start with a, with a character, you end up on the same level. And some, I, I, don't, I don't always, I didn't always do that well. So, so how has the literary, uh, the, the literary business changed over the years? Oh, it's changed a lot, I think. You know, from comparing to the time you wrote your first novel right. to today. It's gone through so many different trends by this time, which I finally gave up. You know, minimalism came in where everything is, um, you say it in very few words. It's very sparse. Neither one of us write that way. No. And no. no. We, then you go through another phase where you deconstruct everything and it's kind of you and then there's metafiction all these different terms and I think what you, anybody does frankly is just unless you're in writing school somewhere is just you have to write the way you feel like you want to write the kind of books you like to read I've thought about that a lot lately, but you just, I think most people just write the kind of books they like to read. And you need a story with most books. Stories go out of fashion sometimes, mm -hmm. in and well, out so, of fashion. And another big, the, the trend uh, uh, from a marketing standpoint, or from an author's point of view, uh, not to the literary point of view, is simply that there are just fewer outlets for, for what you write than there used to be. And there used to be, if you, if you wrote, you know, if, if something reasonably good, it could get published. Mm -hmm. Now the criteria is uh, is is because of the electronic part of it, yeah. and uh, the publishing is secondary. And so um, uh, books that you got to have a you have, they have to be there are only one kind of book that gets published now. It's a bestseller, uh, not the only mm -hmm. kind, but it, for the it's, most it's part, it's a yeah, big yeah. thing. Yeah, and, it's, yeah. and the publishers pay a lot of money for those books. They don't have so much money left as they used to have to bring authors along. I would hate yeah. to be a young author I mean, coming too. up I mean, now. Are, are people reading less today? No. They no, no, they're just reading them on machines. They don't. Yeah. They read them on machines. Yeah. But the publishers get money for those That's right. books That's on right. machines, That's too. Right. So. That's right. That's right. It's, here again, it's still shaking out. 
This is this is another revolution yeah. in the, in the communicating world that hasn't reached a conclusion. Tell us about the characteristics of a good writer, good novelist. A well, good well, I you know you can depend on where you, you begin. Yeah. My my number one characteristic of a good writer is somebody who can keep his or her bottom on the chair to do it. You know, there's a tendency to talk about writing and not writing. Right. And that's the one thing I could do. I'm very, you and could, I'm, yeah, very I always good. kept the bottom of the chair. And to me that, if you don't do that, what the hell, the rest of it's irrelevant. Right. And, uh, you have to focus. Yeah, 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 you have to focus. Yeah. You do. Yeah. You have to physically do it. Right. And uh, it's hard. And you have to usually rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. That's right. With what, not, yeah. You've been married 58 years. Mm -hmm. 58 years, and you still look like you're about 25 and holding. Well, we What's like that. the secret? <laughs> Victor, don't add another word. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what is the secret to this longevity? I think we like each other you most like, of the time. Yeah. We, we enjoy each other's company. Yeah, we do. Yeah, and you got it's hard it would be hard to be married fifty eight years to somebody who's got with you didn't you enjoy their company. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, beyond everything else. Yeah. And we we can still we make jokes with each other. I mean we still laugh with each other, at each other. Um, that's really important. And you know these things can work for you or against you, but the fact that we still write now works for us. Not always did that happen in our lives when That's we right. would try to criticize each other. But we and we I always handled criticism really oh, well. Oh, you really and did. And you, you had a difficulty with it. <laughs> so, you had some but we like the same kind of things. We both like plays. We like music. Yeah. We like books. We can talk about them. We like our, so, our daughters and we yeah, like we our like grandchildren. Our children. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what can we expect from Jim and Kate Lara over the next 10 years? More happiness. Yes, and maybe another book or so. Who sure. knows? Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Maybe we, maybe we should write an opera or something. <laughs> yeah, well. You do the, you do the music, <laughs> I'll do the words. <laughs> we won't go that far. No, no, okay. <laughs> no. But Thank we you. still want to do things. Oh, we do. Yeah. We do, and we're doing them. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being here one on one, in this case now two on one, mm -hmm. but it's fun. And congratulations on being the sponsor of the USS Wichita. Thank and you. Jim, it's great to see you again. Thank you, Victor. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. All right. And thank you for watching this week's edition of One on One. Send your questions or comments to oneonone at kpts.org. I'm Victor Hawkstrom. See you next time.